Welcome to episode 54 of Norse Myths, Legends, and Folktales. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we hear how Emily takes revenge against his uncle and offers a great speech to the people in part three of Emily, Prince of Denmark. On reaching Jutland, he exchanged his present attire for his ancient demeanor, which he had adopted for righteous ends, purposely assuming an aspect of absurdity. Covered with filth, he entered the banquet room where its own obsequences were being held, and struck all men utterly aghast. Rumor having falsely noised abroad his death, at last Hera melted into mirth, and the guests jeered and taunted one another that he whose last rites they were celebrating as though he were dead should appear in the flesh. When he was asked concerning his comrades, he pointed to the sticks he was carrying and said, Here is both the one and the other. This he observed with equal truth and pleasantry, for his speech, though most thought it idle, yet departed not from the truth, for it pointed at the weird guild of the slain as though it were themselves. Thereon wishing to bring the company into a gayer mood, he joined the cupbearers and diligently did the office of plying the drink. Then, to prevent his loose dress hampering his walk, he girded his sword upon his side, and purposely drawing it several times, pricked his fingers with its point. The bystanders accordingly had both sword and scabbard riveted across with an iron nail. Then, to smooth the way more safely to his plot, he went to the lords and plied them heavily with draught upon draught, and drenched them all so deep in wine that their feet were made feeble with drunkenness, and they turned to rest within the palace, making their bed where they had reveled. Then he saw they were in a fit state for his plots, and thought there was a chance offered to do his purpose. So he took out of his bosom the stakes he had long ago prepared, and went into the building, where the grounds lay covered with the bodies of the nobles, wheezing off their sleep and their debauch. Then, cutting away its supports, he brought down the hanging his mother had knitted, which covered the inner as well as the outer walls of the hall. Then he flung upon the snores, and then, applying the crooked stakes, he knotted and bound them up in such insoluble intricacy that not one of the men beneath however hard he might struggle, could contrive to rise. After this, he set fire to the palace. The flames spread, scattering the conflagration far and wide. It enveloped the whole dwelling, destroyed the palace, and burnt them all while they were either buried in deep sleep of vainly striving to arise. Then he went to the chamber of Feng, who had before this had been conducted by his train into his pavilion, plucked up the sword that chanced to be hanging to the bed, and planted his own in its place. Then, awakening his uncle, he told him that his nobles were perishing in the flames, and that Amleth was here, armed with his old crooks to help him, and thirsting to exact the vengeance now long overdue for his father's murder. Feng, on hearing this, leapt from his couch, but was cut down while deprived of his own sword. He strove in vain to draw the strange one. O oh, valiant Amlet, and worthy of immortal fame, who, being shrewdly armed with a feint of folly, covered a wisdom too high for human wit under a marvelous disguise of silliness, and not only found in his subtly means to protect his own safety, but also by its guidance found opportunity to avenge his father. By this skillful defense of himself and strenuous revenge for his parent, he had left it doubtful whether we are to think more of his wit or of his bravery. Amleth, when he had accomplished the slaughter of his stepfather, feared to expose his deed to the fickle judgment of his countrymen, and thought it well to lie in hiding 
till he had learned what the way of the mob of the uncouth populace was tending. So the whole neighborhood, who had watched the blaze during the night, and in the morning desired to know the cause of the fire, they had seen, perceived the royal palace fallen in ashes, and on searching through its ruins, which were yet warm, found only some shapeless remains of burnt corpses, for the devouring flame had consumed everything so utterly that not a single token was left to inform them of the cause of such a disaster. Also, they saw the body of Fang Lang pierced by the sword amid his blood-stained raiment. Some were seized with open anger, others with grief, and some with secret delight. One party bewailed the death of their leader. The other gave thanks that the tyranny of the fratricide was now laid at rest. Thus, the occurrence of the king's slaughter was greeted by the beholders with diverse minds. Amaleth, finding the people so quiet, made bold to leave his hiding, summoning those in whom he knew the memory of his father to be fast-rooted. He went to the assembly, and there made a speech after this manner. Nobles, let not any who are troubled by the piteous end of Horvendel be troubled by the sight of this disaster before ye. Be not ye, I say, troubled, who have remained loyal to your king and duteous to your father. Behold, the corpse, not of a prince, but of a fratricide. Indeed, it was a sorrier sight when you saw our prince lying lamentably butchered by our most infamous fratricide brother. Let me not call him. With your own compassionating eyes, ye have beheld the mangled limbs of Horvendel. They have seen his body done to death with many wounds. Surely that most abominable butcher only deprived his king of life that he might despoil his country of freedom. The hand that slew him made you slay. Who then so mad as to choose Feng the cruel before Horvendel the righteous? Remember how benignly Horvendel fostered you, how justly he dealt with you, how kindly he loved you. Remember how you lost the mildest of princes and justest of fathers, while in his place was put a tyrant and an assassin set up, how your rights were confiscated, how everything was plague-stricken, how the country was stained with infamies, how the yoke was planted on your necks, and how your free will was forfeited. And now all this is over, for ye see the criminal stifled in his own crimes, the slayer of his kins punished for his misdoings. What man of but ordinary wit, beholding it, would account this kindness a wrong? What sane man could be sorry that the crime has recoiled upon the culprit? Who could lament the killing of a most savage executioner, or bewail the righteous dead of most cruel despot? Ye, beholder of the doer of the deed, he is before you. Yea, I own that I have taken vengeance for my country and my father, your hands were equally bound to the task which mine fulfilled. What it would have beseemed you to accomplish with me, I achieved alone. Nor had I any partner in so a glorious a deed, or the service of any man to help me. Not that I forget that you would have helped this work had I asked you. For doubtless you have remained loyal to your king and loving to your prince. But I chose that the wicked should be punished without imperiling you. I thought that others need not set their shoulders to the burden when I deemed my strong enough to bear it. Therefore, I consumed all the others to ashes and left only the trunk of Feng for your hands to burn, so that on this at least you may wreak all your longing for a righteous vengeance." Now, haste up speedily, heap the pyre, burn up the body of the wicked, consume away his guilty limbs, scatter his sinful ashes. 
let no urn or barrow enclose the abominable remnants of his bones. Let no trace of his fratricide remain. Let there be no spot in his own land for his tainted limbs. Let no neighborhood suck infection from him. Let not seed nor soil be defiled by harboring his accursed carcass. I have done the rest. This one loyal duty is left for you. These must be the tyrant's obsequies. This, the funeral procession of the fratricide. It is not seemly that he who stripped his country of her freedom should have ashes covered by his country's earth. Besides, why tell again my own sorrows? Why count over my troubles? Why weave the thread of my miseries anew? Ye know them more fully than I myself. Pursued to the death by my stepfather, scorned by my mother, spat upon by friends, have passed my years in pitiable wise, and my days in adversity, and my insecure life has teemed with fears and perils. In fine, I passed every season of my age wretchedly and in extreme calamity. Often in your secret murmurings together, you have sighed over my lack of wits. There was none, you said, to avenge the father, none to punish the fratricide. And in this, I found a secret testimony of your love, for I saw that the memory of the king's murder had not yet faded from your minds. Whose breast is so hard that it can be softened by no fellow feeling for what I have felt? Who is so stiff and stony that he is swayed by no compassion for my griefs? Ye whose hands are clean of the blood of Horvendel, pity your fostering lean. Be moved by my calamities. Pity also my stricken mother. And rejoice with me that the infamy of her who was once your queen is quenched. For this weak woman had to bear a twofold weight of ignominy, embracing one who was her husband's brother and murderer. Therefore, to hide my purpose of revenge and to veil my wit, I counterfeited a listless bearing. I feigned dullness. I planned a stratagem. And now you can see with your own eyes whether it was succeeded, whether it has achieved its purpose to the full. I am content to leave you to judge so great a matter. It is your turn. Tremble underfoot the ashes of the murderer. Disdain the dust of him who slew his brother and defiled his brother's queen with infamous desecration, who outraged his sovereign and treasonably assailed his majesty, who brought the sharpest tyranny upon you, stole your freedom, and crowned fratricides with incest. I have been the agent of this just vengeance. I have burned for this righteous retribution. Uphold me with a high-born spirit. Pay me the homage that you owe me. Warm me with your kindly looks. It is I who have wiped off my country's shame, I, who have quenched my mother's dishonor. I, who have beaten back oppression. I, who have put to death the murderer. I, who have baffled the artful hand of my uncle with retorted arts. Were he living, each new day would have multiplied his crimes. I resented the wrong done to father and to fatherland. I slew him who was governing you outrageously and more hardly than it beseemed men. Acknowledge my service. Honor my wit. Give me the throne if I have earned it. For you have in me one who has done you mighty service and who is no degenerate heir to his father's power. No fratricide. But the lawful successor to the throne and a dutiful avenger of the crime of murder. You have me to thank for the recovery of the blessings of freedom, for release from the power of him who vexed you, for relief from the oppressor's yoke, for shaking off the sway of the murderer, for trampling the despot's scepter underfoot. It is I who have stripped you of your slavery and clothed you with freedom, 
I have restored your height of fortune and given you your glory back. I have deposed the despot and triumphed over the butcher. In your hands is the reward. You know what I have done for you, and from your righteousness I ask my wage. Every heart had been moved while the young man thus spoke. He affected some to compassion, and some even more to tears. When the lamentation ceased, he was appointed king by prompt general acclaim. For one and all rested the greatest hope on his wisdom, since he had devised the whole of such an achievement with the deepest cunning, and accomplished it with the most astonishing contrivance. Many could have seen marveling how he had concealed so subtle a plan over a long space of time. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.